Hi everyone, today I want to do a little video to give beginners and seasoned artists a reason to hate me. And that is by uh, talking about all the misconceptions ArcViz artists tend to have and weirdly cherish uh, in order to fuel their frustration with their clients. So let's have fun and see how many of you had these uh, misconceptions in the past and how many of you still do today. Just to make you less angry already, just know that I've had those misconceptions and that's why it was easy for me to do this video because I just had to look at what I've been doing be, uh, in the past. But overcoming them and overcoming those misconceptions, even though it was quite hard, has tremendously uh, improved my business relationship and that's why I wanted to share this video with you. So let's start with item number one. In a competitive market, there are many ways to tackle demand and lock down a contract. Uh, lowering fees is usually what comes to mind to beginners, but there are like many, many reasons not to go down that road. Uh, the first reason I think is that there will always be someone cheaper than you. It's plain simple, but it is the case. So that's a good reason, I think. <laughs> uh, the idea is that when you lower your fees as well, or your what you charge, the issue is that you're sending the wrong signal to your client and the signal you're sending is not I'm an expert in what and I know what I'm doing, but more I don't value my time and I don't value my work and please work with me. I don't know what else to do. So being too cheap can really be counterproductive when you're actually looking for clients. One of the main consequences as well of being too cheap or like lowering your fees too much is that you're going to attract cheap clients and by cheap clients, I don't mean clients that don't have like big budgets. But I mean clients that are only going to judge the quality of your work through the lens of the money it costs. So basically, instead of looking at how much uh, value you're bringing to the table, they're just going to look at how much money you're costing, which is not a really good way of looking at the work of visualization because it's a marketing approach. Another thing to keep in mind when, when lowering your fees is that it is much, much harder to uh, increase them afterwards. One way to get around this uh, issue is to always put in writing that you're uh, charging different than what you would be charging properly. So if you do a discount, put it in writing uh, so that your clients actually understand that this is not the actual price he, should, he or she should be uh, paying. And again, though, uh, the discount should be extremely rare and only done with loyal customers. You don't want to do any discount with new clients because this is going to be sending the wrong signals. So properly demonstrated, expertise will usually lead to higher fees, better referrals, better clients, and um, basically like a stronger portfolio, I'd say. So compete on expertise, but don't compete on price. Item number two, bring your own methodology to the table. The main mistakes that most people do early in, this, uh, in their ArcVis career is to try to fit in their client's methodology. And the truth is that you actually need to impose your own methodology early in the process and convince the clients that this is the most uh, sensible way to go. Note that I'm not saying you have to impose your ideas or your brief, but you bring your own methodology or workflow, which is quite different. The main justification for that is that if your client came to you, it's because it's after like your certain amount of quality or like the certain standards that you've set in your portfolio. And the only way you can reach those standards is by working the way you like to work. So what you need to do is to tie the quality of your work with the way you work. And that way you can reassure your clients that he's going to get the best work and you can reassure yourself that you're going to be in the ideal um, situation and the ideal conditions to um, create the image you've been asked for. So clarify your process and make sure you and your clients stick to it so that you maximize the good quality of your uh, output and minimize the potential uh, frustrations. Serve the client, not your portfolio. Beginners often mistakenly see a client as a way to work on cool projects and uh, get nice images down the road. But this mindset can only lead to frustration because uh, from both parties because it means you're not collaborating towards the same goal. Bluntly put, your clients doesn't care about your artist's ego and if you like the image you're doing or not. What he cares about is if he likes the image or not or she likes. So uh, you will only be happy when you start like reshaping your ideas and realigning your goals so that they fit your client's goal. 
So don't superimpose your own goals on your clients and make sure that their goals is your own goal as well. And this leads me to item number four, which goes a little bit deeper on the same topic. A beautiful image is not necessarily a successful image. Usually the one thing that uh, the artist will strive for is trying to make the most uh, beautiful image they can, but the most beautiful image can still fail to do its job. That's why you need to understand the difference or like or the key to separating a good looking image from a successful image. And that difference is clarity of intent. Uh, this is why I think it's important to let go of your like uh, artist persona at first and understand that they're is like there are concessions that can be made on the artistic point of view in order to maximize the legibility of the intent of the project. Of course, the more skillful you are, the easier it will be to combine both a compelling artistic approach with the successful communication of your client's intent. But the clarity of intent should always prevail. To uncover the actual intent of your image, you have to sit at the table with your client and set the brief together and not just take their self-diagnosis for granted, uh, the one that they did before meeting you. A project's intent will usually cover several concepts, and depending on the type of clients and the type of images you're about to do, the intent will also vary in types. So this can literally uh, range from like highly conceptual topics like social interactions and light and transparency to down-to-earth ones, like uh, the way you treat the context, the connection to heritage building, or the activities that is going to take place in the space. Once you're done identifying the intent of the uh, project, you can start working on your proposal on how to better depict them. This will inform like the ratio of your image, the lighting, the color palette, the atmosphere, and the overall mood. And your job throughout the process of getting to the final image will be, well, to make sure that the image looks nice, but above all, to make sure that the creative direction you chose fits and better serves the intent. Also, in terms of business relationship, showing that you care about your uh, client's goals and about the, how the building is perceived will help the client uh, in trusting you more in the future so that uh, later down the road with other projects, they maybe will give you more leeway and creative freedom in dealing with the brief. But even though uh, sometimes you have to remember that maybe a blue sky can still be the best way to serve your intent. Final item, don't keep clients that don't fit. Uh, the drawback of identifying like these misconceptions and building a strong process and standing by it, like not lowering your fees not, uh, or imposing your own methodology, is that sometimes you can have clients that are not receptive to that approach. And it is of course like entirely understandable and nobody should be blaming anyone for that. But whether they are not receptive to your approach or don't have the budget or don't fit the time frame. What you have to is to resist the urge to actually and absolutely work with all the clients that call you. Of course, you can take the client, but make sure that you're going through the checking uh, process, if I may say. And if you didn't and the relationship doesn't work out and the final images are crap, well, then don't come back complaining about the client being bad because the only person that is to blame here is actually you. A good practice I've found when a client obviously don't fit is to refer that client to another fellow artist that you know and that would be a better fit. Uh, interestingly, I often see people being reluctant to do so because they feel that they are giving away contracts for free and that they're losing a client that they could potentially work with. But the reality is slightly different. First, if you still can't convince your client to um, adopt your process after explaining its benefits, then it means that you're going to have to adopt their process. And uh, this is something you want to avoid at all costs, because at least in my experience, this won't lead to a fruitful relationship and even worse, sometimes it will degrade the reputation you've been trying to build as an expert. Second, you can always take a commission uh, on the work done by the artist that you're giving the project to and trust that they will return you the favor when sometimes they have like a project they can't do and think they would be a good fit for you. And on top of that, remember that the more you work with a strong process and uh, achieve great results, the more you're going to build your expertise, the more you're going to build a strong portfolio. But more importantly, the pool of clients that you'll be building will be a, of, uh, a pool of clients of strong referrals uh, for your methodology and your work. And the funny part is that uh, as time passes and as you keep on building that strong portfolio, the client back then that you didn't manage to close might come back with a more open mind. 
So staying true to your process and only working with clients that fit will ensure that uh, will translate into a limited pool of clients that will pay well and respect your work rather than a large pool of clients that don't respect your work and don't pay well and drain your energy. So don't keep clients that don't fit. Refer the those clients to others that could uh, benefit from it and focus on clients that you do have and that do fit. Of course, as for any list, it is entirely subjective, but from my experience, uh, correcting these main five misconceptions have been a huge game changer. I hope these items uh, raise consciousness uh, to starting freelancers and firms that have been overly frustrated with their latest gigs and were wondering how to fix it. I honestly think that the first step is fixing yourself and fixing your mindset. And the second step is finding fitting clients and weed out the ones that don't fit. And you can only do that by staying true to your core principles and methodology. So it is a long process altogether, but I think it's a deeply necessary one. So good luck. <laughs> and as usual, feel free to share your thought and experience in the comment section. Like the video, share the video if you think it's interesting uh, for other Arvis artists. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Bye.